Hello guys, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, today, we're basically going to do a breakdown of the hijacking SSL video that we posted a little bit earlier, and just going to give you a little more insight into how that attack actually worked. Um, because when we did the video, we wanted to just kind of, you know, give you a proof of concept, show you how that it actually all works. And then, you know, my experience has been once you show people, they see something work, then they're typically more curious as to how it works. Uh, if we just jump in and start breaking down SSL and talking about how that works, uh, it's not going to be as digestible is, as it will be after you've seen the actual video and seen it happen. So hopefully you've looked at the video of how this works before you jumped in and looked at this uh, detailed breakdown. So let's go ahead and continue. So, you know, what we trust is the fact that when you go to a website, uh, it could be a bank, it could be your email, anywhere that you securely log in, you trust the fact that when you hit that SSL button, you hit that button that says secure login, that you're indeed logging in securely. Um, so we start off with HTTP, which is just clear text communications. We hit that login button and then seemingly, instantly, we're now ported to being inside this encrypted tunnel called SSL. Therefore, our traffic can't be sniffed and we feel safe and secure. Well, <clears throat> famous last words of that, you know, when, when I've talked to people about this and, and, you know, how it can be hijacked, it's, well, you know, it's 256-bit cipher strength minimal these days. Uh, that would take, you know, 20 lifetimes to break it's impossible to break in any reasonable amount of time but you know my question is always well you know who says we have to break it the encryption or crack the encryption to actually attack and uh, you know f exploit vulnerabilities in SSL and the answer is we don't now basically you know this is how the process works and you know this is very general overview uh, the client first starts the handshake process server responds to that request in that request the server is going to include its SSL certificate in that certificate is going to be the server's public key now just a minute here to talk briefly about public key private key just in case somebody doesn't quite understand how that works basically um, a public key is used to encrypt stuff alright and the only way to decrypt something encrypted with a public key is have the associated private key and in this instance the only somebody or something in the world that's got the associated private key that goes with this public key that this server is sending across is that web server so we move on you know he sends that certificate over we take that public key now we generate on the client side we generate a secret that's the pre-shared secret key all right, it could be one, two, three, four, for simplicity's sake. So now we take that and we encrypt it with the web server's public key. Then we can safely now send that back across the wire, back across the web, because it's encrypted with the public key that nobody has the private key to break it other than the web server. So it gets back to the web server. Web server decrypts that message. Now the web server knows that the secret's one, two, three. The client knows the secret's one, two, three because the client created the secret. We both know the secret. We securely transported it to the other side. Now we establish our encrypted tunnel using that key on both sides. And at that point, we kind of go from a public key crypto system, which is where we started, to almost private key or shared key. And for this reason, uh, you hear people describe SSL as being uh, kind of a hybrid type of encryption hybrid PKI hybrid symmetric or hybrid symmetric hybrid asymmetric uh, you know the two methodologies really combined into one uh, big crypto engine here so once you've done this you have your secure communications alright moving on you know remember we start just plain old HTTP like we see here then after all this stuff that we see coming up here after all of these this process happens with the SSL handshake we end up now with this so we've got our secure connection here 
And, you know, we just trust that. We've trusted it for years that once we do that login, once we do that handshake, you know, that traffic's encrypted. No one can ever decrypt it. Well, that's not 100% true. Uh, let's look at it from another perspective. What if there was a way to get around the encryption instead of trying to break it? In other words, if I wanted to break into your house, you know, for the average, let's, let's take the average residential home. The average residential home, the key that unlocks your front door, there's approximately 50,000 potential key cuts that could open your front door. Now, if I'm a burglar, I'm not going to sit there with 50,000 different keys and try them all to break into your house. With the same ideology here, I'm not going to sit and wait 150 years to try to crack your SSL. If I'm a burglar, I'll go through the chimney, I'll break a window, I will go around the locking mechanism. And this is exactly what we're going to look at as far as how to defeat SSL. Uh, for example, what if we attacked not the actual encryption, but if we attacked the transition from unencrypted to encrypted? In other words, when we did our when we do our little magic, our whole handshake to go from HTTP to HTTPS, what if we attacked at that point and tried to exploit that somehow? Well, you know, there is a way to do that. And that way is something called SSL strip. Now there are several ways to do it. SSL strip is, I like this way because it gives us several advantages. One of, one of those is the fact that the client or the victim won't see that little pesky uh, message that pops up that says that this certificate can't be validated. Now essentially in the video we did a man in the middle between the victim and the gateway. So in other words we made the victim think we're the gateway. Therefore whenever the victim tries to go out to the web or to another network that traffic comes to us first because it thinks we're the gateway. Now, you know, this is beyond the scope of describing basic man in the middle. If you don't understand how that works, go take a look at my um, man in the middle video against FTP, which is on the same resource site you're looking at this video on right now. Now, once we've got the traffic, SSL strip will then create a fake valid certificate, or I like to say semi-valid certificate, mimicking the target web server that the victim's trying to connect to. Now, let's look at that for a second and see how this works. So, the process of certificate chaining, it works by making whatever your target is, for example, yahoo.com, a leaf or child of our own domain. So, for example, we could take infosecinstitute.com and then append to that yahoo.com dot infosecinstitute.com and essentially that's a valid certificate if our own Infosec Institute certificate is valid or issued from a trusted authority. Now SSL strip automates all this for you. This is not something you need to, to, to understand to make the tool work. But you know I, I want you to kind of understand what's going on behind the scenes with it uh, so when it doesn't work you know where to start troubleshooting. So let's look at this certificate chaining process here a little bit more. So we'll start on the left side here. Um, if you look at that, you know, let's take a root CA or a root certificate authority like VeriSign. All right, so VeriSign issues a certificate, let's say a class three, to an intermediate certificate authority. And this, these intermediate certificate authorities are in the thousands. Now, you can look in your browser in Internet Explorer. You, you go to your tools and go to Internet Options, and then look at Privacy, I believe it is, and then look at Certificates. Click on the tab that says Intermediate, and you will be surprised to find how many intermediate authorities are just by default in Internet Explorer. And I'll tell you another dirty little secret. There are several, several, and by several I mean over ten, that are hard-coded in the IE that you cannot take out. You don't even see them. So the root issues a validated certificate to the intermediate authority. All right, The intermediate authority can then issue a certificate to a leaf such as InfoSecInstitute.com. Now with InfoSec having its own certificate that's not really trusted but kind of because it came from an intermediate authority, it can now issue its own certificates 
basically uh, any form or format we want. Primarily, all we needed to do is be part of InfoSecInstitute.com. So we could say gmail.com dot InfoSecInstitute.com. When the validation process happens, this is going to be validated as a valid certificate. So if we jump over to the right side at the bottom now, well, obviously gmail.com dot InfoSecInstitute.com is not trusted. And we're moving up the right side. The leaf InfoSecInstitute.com is not trusted because its certificate got issued from a intermediate, not a trusted root authority. Now we move on up the chain a little bit more. The the uh, intermediate certificate authorities not really trusted, kind of, but not really. It depends on your browser, what's in there as a trusted intermediate authority, so forth and so on. But as this validation process continues up the chain here, eventually we will get to a root CA like VeriSign. We will do a hash comparison or something of that nature. And what happens is that certificate is validated via a third party. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I want you to think of it this way. Think of it, you know, in Chicago we got this thing where, you know, you don't know anybody that can do this, but you know a guy that knows a guy. And what I'm saying here is, hey, I know a guy who knows a guy, who knows this guy, and that guy says that this guy is okay and can be trusted. We don't trust the leaf, nor do we even trust the intermediate, but we do trust VeriSign, which is the root. So if VeriSign says the intermediate's okay, the intermediate says that our leaf is okay and our leaf says the leaf of our leaf is okay well then we've got like a five-way validation trust process going on there 